I bought a ring light. Can you tell? I mean, I guess I could make some makeup tutorials or I could just stare at you with giant circles over my eyeballs. That's great. Anyway, ring light notwithstanding, what today's lecture video is about is the writing process. It's a thing that you are going to become very familiar with in this class, although it, to some extent I'm sure you're already familiar with it on account of you've, have, you've written things before, right? I mean, I assume you're not in college without having ever written anything before. You could surprise me, but I suspect you have a process and it's maybe fledgling maybe every time you sit down to write something it feels like you're pulling teeth which happens it still kind of feels like that for me even though I'm pretty good at writing at this point um, just because the more you write the better you get at it uh, I've had a lot of years of practice so here are some of my tips I uh, want to outline the writing process for you and talk about what the different steps of it are and I want you to think about how this uh, describes or doesn't describe your own writing process. What is your process like uh, in terms of these steps? Do you do it the same way? Uh, is there something you've got to have in order to write? And your discussion post this, this week will ask you to reflect on that. So here we go. I can't help it. I just make finger guns. I'm sorry. I'm a dork. You really need to frame it as a process of creation and those of you who do art will understand there are certain things you need to do before you just start slapping paint on a canvas and throwing it in a gallery uh, so the same is true of the writing process and it's been broken down into steps to help you think about the way that you write and the way that you're composing uh, hopefully as a means to help you metacognitively which is to say thinking about thinking uh, to metacognitively engage with the writing process in a more useful way. Ultimately, that this process is meant to help you as you are tackling assignments like writing an essay. So the steps to the writing process are pre-writing, outlining and organizing, drafting, revising, editing and proofreading, and then publishing and submitting. And of course, you'll see the arrow here, revising leads back into drafting, and those two become like a little circular maelstrom. We'll talk more about what that means when we get to that step. But do know that although these steps are very laid out in a linear numbered fashion, that doesn't mean that the writing process is a linear process. Writing is a recursive process, and we'll talk about what that means as we go through these slides. So when we talk about pre-writing, the things that fall under pre-writing are things like brainstorming, free writing, mind mapping, clustering. It also involves considering your purpose and audience for the piece that you're about to write and scheduling yourself in a thoughtful way to leave yourself enough time to tackle the assignment. Um, Brainstorming can look like a lot of different things. It can look like just throwing notes down on a piece of paper. Uh, it can look like um, coming up with uh, note cards and rearranging them or, you know, using post-it notes to move ideas around on a, a larger piece of paper. Free writing is just that. You sit down, you set a timer for a certain amount of time, and you just write about the thing that you were trying to talk about. You do it without editing yourself. You do it without second guessing yourself. There's no backspacing. You're just getting ideas out of your brain onto paper. You can do it when you're typing. You can do it in your note typing. You can do it in your notes app. You can do it on a piece of paper. You can keep a journal of free writing, uh, which will actually improve your writing skills. So mind mapping, uh, this is, uh, I'm sure you've seen lots of uh, people with little bubbles that they move around that have little lines in between them. Mind mapping is a really good exercise for trying to narrow down from a broad subject to a specific topic. And we'll be talking about that more uh, later in the semester when we talk about subjects and topics. 
clustering is similar. You list a main category and then some smaller things that would fall underneath it. That can help you think about how to organize the paper. It can think, help you think about how to narrow down your topic. And then when you get to considering purpose and audience, it's important to think about who's going to read this. If somebody is in second grade and you're writing uh, instructions for how to wash your hands, you're going to write it differently than if you're writing for an adult. If you are writing a Facebook post that's well, I know nobody's on Facebook anymore, even I'm not on Facebook. If you're writing an Instagram post that's going out to uh, a, an audience of your friends and peers, that's going to look very different than if you are, for instance, writing a uh, an, an essay in a class for a professor that maybe has images in it. So your purpose and your audience, uh, they are very tied together, but they also strongly shape how you approach writing something. You probably don't think about it a lot, but you do this every day. It's a kind of negotiation that we enter into when we're talking to different people. Um, it's a kind of code switching really between different social and professional situations where we have ideas about what's expected of us versus who we are and how we want to portray ourselves and be uh, how we want to be understood. And of course, scheduling, you know, he probably helps you to think about this uh, in terms of how long do I think it's going to take me to write this? How long do I think I need to leave myself to revise and edit it? When is it due? Uh, starting the night before, probably not the best idea. Can't say I've never done it, but do as I say, not as I do. Uh, if you would like to live a happy, non-tortured life, unlike me. So in the pre-writing stage, what you're really doing is narrowing down your really doing is narrowing down your subject. You're considering tactics, tact, tactics, tactics to approach the subject, and you're thinking about what needs to be included to get your point across to the audience. And again, like I said, the audience changes depending on what you're writing and who you're writing for. So think about who that audience is to help inform what information you need to include. If you're writing a film essay for a bunch of people reading a film magazine, they're probably going to understand some film terms. Whereas if random person is, uh, who's not in the film area is going to be reading it, you're probably going to need to define a lot more of the terminology that you would use normally. That's one of those literacies. Like who is reading it? Are they literate in what you're writing about? If you were writing about cancer research, I, an English major, probably I'm going to need more information than if you're writing to one of your fellow, uh, uh, like research teammates. Okay. It's obvious, but it helps to think about that as you are pre-writing. The next step in the process, outlining and organizing. You are identifying a thesis. You're thinking about how to structure the essay in order to support that thesis. You're creating an outline and you're thinking about how to develop your topic. Okay. When you're outlining and organizing, you're thinking about how best to present the information you need to include to support that thesis. That's why it's helpful. Even if your thesis statement is going to change as you get into the process of writing, it helps to start with one, even if it's going to be revised, because it gives you a place to start to think about structuring your essay to support that thesis. Right? So the thesis includes the main ideas. What are those main ideas? How can you support them? This is where outlining really comes in handy. Um, I'm not requiring outlines as part of your essays or anything, but I would suggest you try them out as a tool if you haven't done a lot of outlining before. Um, an outline doesn't have to be crazy formal. It is a working document. It is a tool for you. And often it will change as you write. I've actually done them before. Um, with little post-it notes, little post-it notes on a bigger sheet of paper so that I could move things around as I was writing and as how I needed to structure my argument changed. So again, you could do that with a computer, but you know, I'm old school. So, um, but an outline can help you stay on track as you are writing and composing. So here's an example of an outline. I just threw this together. This isn't a paper I've actually written. Um, but you see here, I've started with a thesis statement 
And then I think about how I can structure the body of my paper to support that thesis statement, right? So in the thesis statement, I say that the cabin in the woods makes use of a final girl formula, <clears throat> but it's nonetheless a feminist horror film. So you can probably guess from that that the final girl formula is largely considered not to be a feminist kind of trope uh, because of, you know, words like although and never the, nonetheless. So that, that already cues you into kind of how I'm thinking about structuring my argument. So in the intro, I'm going to have to tell somebody a little bit about the film in case they don't know it. Give them a little bit of information of what the film is about. Talk about who the director and the writer is um, or are. Uh, because it's written and directed by two people. Uh, and then I might mention, because I'm looking at this in a feminist lens, I might mention that the one of the writer's previous work is largely considered feminist. And then, of course, your thesis gets dropped at the end of your introduction. The final girl um, becomes my next point, because as you're reading the thesis... The final girl is sort of the, the first main idea that you come to in my thesis statement. So I'm going to put that next, and I'm going to need to define what a final girl is, right? And so I have some subpoints there of things that I need to make sure that I mention in the definition. I <clears throat> have planned out to quote Carol Clover, who wrote a, a really wonderful book called Men, Women, and Chainsaws. Uh, highly recommend if you're interested in horror and gender. But so you can see here, I've got these things indented to let me know that those are all sort of under that body section about the final girl. And then I've got <clears throat> how the final girl trope gets used. That's my next main point. <clears throat> I should be gesturing. I'm gesturing at the screen. You just can't see me. So, but this is what a very informal sort of quickly thrown together outline looks like. It's not complete because I'm in a room on the screen, but you get the idea. Um, it's a useful tool. If you get stuck on a section, don't sit there grinding your wheels. Jump to another section. You have the outline that tells you what your plan was, so you can go ahead and jump to another section and start working on that and come back to the part that was giving you trouble. So don't think you have to write in order. Moving on. The next step in the process after you've outlined and organized and thought about how it's all going to go together is drafting because at some point you have to sit down and you have to write the thing and this is the stage where that happens um, and again pro tip you do not have to draft an order this is where the outline becomes really helpful because you can go back to your outline if you're having trouble in a section you can jump ahead to another section that's like more clear in terms of your plan and you can come back to the harder section that you're working on earlier later uh, the point of drafting is to start to get the ideas out on paper. The first draft is what's called um, a, the child's draft, or often you'll hear people in composition talk about shitty first drafts, which is a term that Anne Lamott coined in her novel or her uh, nonfiction work, Bird by Bird, which is about writing. And the shitty first draft just means you are getting some words on paper you're going to massage them, you're going to shape them, you're going to revise them and edit them, you're going to create something beautiful out of them, but first you have to get some ideas out. It can look rough the first way through, but like I said, writing is a recursive process. This means that you come back to a point and work through another stage. And that's why the arrow between drafting and editing was in the list initially. You've made an outline, right? Because you took my advice about what a valuable tool it is. That outline frees you from starting at word one of the intro and writing until the final word of the conclusion. It is often easier to write out of order, especially if you're writing something research-based instead of a narrative. In terms of a narrative, sometimes it's helpful to write in order so that you make sure you get all the important things in chronological order. When it comes to uh, nonfiction work, research-based work, it may be easier to jump around. Maybe you need to keep researching one particular section, but you have the research for another section, you can go ahead and start drafting that section. If you get stuck in a section, switch to another section. There's no reason to sit there and just stare at the computer screen and be wasting time. 
um, writer's block. I'm not saying it's not real, but I am saying there are tactics for coping with it. And that is to turn your attention to a different part. And then your brain will kind of like cogitate on what it is you're trying to figure out while you're doing something else and being productive. Another thing that I would suggest in terms of drafting and not writing in order is that I have a lot of trouble with introductions. This is a, a common thing for people writing essays. Skip it. You don't have to write it at the beginning. You can write the introduction last. And I often do because once I've written the rest of the paper, I know exactly what it is I'm introducing and what ideas it's important for the reader to have at the outset to understand what the body of my paper is saying. So yeah, I write the intro last or I will at least heavily revise it after I've written the rest of the paper. Again, you don't have to write in order. Nobody will know at the end. Like I said, drafting and revising are very interlinked. It's a very sort of intimate back and forth between the two of them. Um, sometimes we'll revise sentences as we're typing them. So it's, this is detailed like it's a one long linear process, but it is not. Revise literally means look again, revision, right? So revising means to look at, to go back through, to reconsider the way that you've phrased something, the way that you've supported an idea. You're looking at sort of the big, uh, the big factors here. And we're not talking about like, this isn't the spelling check section. This is you're making sure that your ideas is reported. You're making sure that your paper is continuing in a logical fashion, right? And you're sort of, you tend to revise and draft sort of at the same time or uh, interspersed with one another, the more comfortable you get writing when you're not just trying to like write a first draft, save it, revise that into a second draft, save that. Um, often it's a very messy sort of process. And you want to be, be sure that at some point you give yourself time to walk away from the document you're working on. The longer you can give yourself to walk away from it, 24 hours is almost a minimum. Two or three days, you're going to see things differently than you did when you were like in the, the heat of working of it, on it, when you're like in the throes of that particular compositional misery. When you give yourself some time and some space from the thing you're working on, you're going to have a better sense of how your ideas are developing where you still need to support certain other ideas, get a better idea about if the structure is working or needs to be adjusted. So again, give yourself some time. I know that's one of the hardest things to do is to just not start at the last minute. But if you can teach yourself, schedule yourself to write, you know, touch something for like 20 minutes a day, you can do anything for 20 minutes. So if you work on it in smaller chunks, you're going to have a better view of the thing as a whole after you've walked away from it for a little while and come back. I said a lot of that on the other slide. You might revise as your draft. You might revise one section and go on to the next. Writing is a messy, nonlinear process, especially the longer of a composition you are penning, writing, penning, P-E-N-N. -N, uh, the more messy it tends to get. It can look super crazy. We tend to think it's linear and tidy because what you see is a final finished product that's been revised and edited, but that isn't a productive way to, to try to compose often. Don't be afraid to jump around, especially when you're stuck. As long as you're carefully editing at the end, nobody's going to see that process. Uh, it, that process becomes kind of the man behind the curtain, like in The Wizard of Oz. The process is hidden by the polished, finished product. So just to give you an example, this is a draft uh, of the introduction to my dissertation that I'm currently trying to write. Um, and even in Word, this looks like a hot mess. And here's why. 
Um, as I'm drafting, I kind of like jump around and I'll go back through and I'll, you know, reread a section, decide if I'm kind of like jump around and I'll go back through and I'll, you know, reread a section, decide if I'm happy with it. Uh, I will um, use different fonts. I will type in a font I don't like, and then once I've revised it enough and I'm happy with it, I'll change it to a font I do like, the, the like final font, which is just a visual cue so that I know I've been through this, I haven't been through this. Um, sometimes I get stuck on trying to say what I want to say in the way I want to say it, and I can't think of what I want to type. I'll just type in all caps, uh, and I'll often highlight it so that I know to come back and you know, put a cogent idea in here and not just the sort of like garbage placeholder language that I've inserted into the text, right? Um, you see in the middle of the page where I've uh, highlighted smartphones and I've left myself a comment, right? Um, again, another cue to think about this at a time in the future. I'm trying to get the ideas out the first time through and I want to get it on paper and then I can think about it later. Think about if it makes sense. Think about if I need to adjust it, right? Um, and also what I have a tendency to do, you'll see this like baby paragraph thing, snippet lit at the bottom of the page here. Um, I've started sort of mid thought, um, but this is very much like the first draft of what I'm writing here. Uh, so it's single spaced. And once I've been through something at least once or twice, I will double space it. So that way I know that the, the single spaced sections are the first draft of something I've written. And then I've got to go back and touch it again, look at it again. So again, you know, it's a working document. I'm going to edit and proofread it at the end. So as I'm drafting and revising sort of interspersed with one another, um, I use the affordances of the technology of Word or whatever word processing I'm using to make it really obvious where I am, where my thought processes are, and what I need to do to help myself, uh, you know, get, you, you got to get through the thing to get the ideas out. So it can look messy when it's in process. You often don't see this part of the process. You see the nice finished draft which hopefully one day I will have completed. After you've drafted and revised, drafted and revised, you get to the editing and proofreading stage. Now, you will hear people use revise and edit sort of interchangeably, but they are, there is a difference between them that's important. Revising is really dealing with the essay as a whole. You want to make sure the ideas are supported, that they are logical, that um, you're conveying them well, right? Like it's in the revising process, what you're really trying to do is improve what it's what you're saying. The editing process, which kind of comes when you're like happy with what it says and how the ideas are presented, is the part where you look at the more technical aspects. You're looking at how it's said. So in the editing process, you're looking for grammar, punctuation, formatting, things like this. It's editing is a distinct process from revising, even though they get interchangeably used. So that's why editing is paired with proofreading in the, the writing process. When you edit, you're trying to improve your sentence structure, right? Uh, do you have any misplaced objects that don't make sense? Do you have prepositional phrases that could be located closer to their object? Do you have pronouns that don't have antecedents? Um, you want to read through for those things so that your reader doesn't get confused. You want to make sure your verb tenses are consistent. You want to make sure you've got subject verb agreement. Singular verbs take a singular subject. Singular subject takes a singular verb, vice versa. Um, you want to make sure your MLA formatting is correct. It's another part of the editing process. Again, the draft that you saw of mine a couple slides ago, that is not in MLA format yet. It is a hot format mess because I'm not to the editing process yet. I'm still revising and drafting. So once you're done, I mean, if you're writing something short, you can do the MLA formatting as you go. The longer the piece is, 
um, the more convenient it is to just go through at the end and make sure everything's in MLA format. The editing process is also where you check your punctuation and spelling. You might employ something like Grammarly, which I will warn you is not always correct, but it's pretty good. It pretty good. It will tend to say things like this is wordy when really what you've said is fine. Um, so, you know, Grammarly or grammar check or spell check, your mileage may, your mileage may vary widely between those things. But they do exist and you do have access to them. So I'm not telling you not to use them, but you have to be smarter than the digital tool with which you are working. Uh, the spell check will not catch homonym errors, for instance. Um, the grammar check in Word is often uh, wrong when it comes to commas. Um, not always, but many times it is very confused about commas. So that's why it never hurts to have a human person uh, a friend or a tutor or a mentor look over to help you catch proofreading mistakes that computer technology is not really smart enough to catch yet. Um, and also because as you're rereading your own paper, your brain knows what you meant to say. So sometimes if you don't have enough distance, your brain sees what it was thinking instead of what you have actually typed. I do this a lot, which is why it's really important for me to have a friend look at something before I'm turning something important in. That's what editors in the real world exist for. Uh, the real world, like this isn't the real world. Sorry, that was very condescending and I apologize. This is all very much the real world. Anyway, as the last point on this slide says, before your final edit, you want to read your paper aloud. This is a good tactic for finding errors that you might not otherwise find. Um, even if you're just reading it to yourself, but if you can read it to somebody else, even better. Because the process of reading aloud can sometimes trigger you to catch a mistake you'd otherwise miss because you're in the process of translating it into speech, which is a different brain, like a different neurological pathway. So you might see an error that you wouldn't have seen if you were just reading in your head. Um, it also, reading aloud, if something is phrased really sort of clunkily or strangely, hearing yourself say it out loud might help you catch that instance of awkwardness. So uh, that before you turn anything in, you should have read it aloud at least once. Last step of the process, publishing and submitting. Um, obviously publishing for classwork means submitting it to the submission folder in iCollege. Um, inevitably, as soon as you submit or publish something, <laughs> the rule is you will see at least one error as soon as you hit the submit button. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I have sent <clears throat> an essay off to somebody and then like I look back at the essay and I'm like, oh, hey, look at that, uh, you know, misplaced object or something. You'll catch it as soon as you hit submit. It's a rule. But if you were careful in the editing process, there shouldn't be a lot of that, right? And one thing I will say is just always make sure you're submitting in the right format. Uh, for this class, I'm asking you to submit in a .doc or .docx format. So you want to make sure that you are, even if you've drafted it, you know, in pages or whatever, maybe submitting uh, requires you to export it to a different file format. So again, that's one of those things you just want to check before you hit that submit or publish button. So to review, the writing process steps are pre-writing, outlining and organizing, drafting and revising, editing and proofreading, and then publishing or submitting. And that uh, big yellow re uh, recursive arrow is there between revising and drafting because those two really sort of exist on the same plane. They tend to go hand in hand. So I hope that this has been a helpful way to consider this writing process in terms of how to start, how to get started, how to pr proceed through the steps of writing, and then how to go back through and uh, think about the way that you approach revision and editing.
Did I mention I got a ring light that can also double as a one woman party in my office? Uh, because I did. Because why wouldn't you, right? Anyway, I hope that this discussion of the writing process has uh, been interesting. Um, it's probably not super interesting, but it is germane to the topic of composition, which is the class that you're in, which is why you have to watch this. Um, but do uh, think about trying some of these methods out. I especially recommend outlining. It doesn't have to be super formal. It, you don't get caught up about Roman numerals and how it's supposed to be structured. But think about the outline as a useful way to get your thoughts in order and plan everything out before you get started. When a builder is building a house, to make a belabored example, the builder doesn't just get some wood and put it together. The builder takes time to, uh, you know, create blueprints. Actually, probably the architect creates the blueprints. Bad metaphor. But a house is built from plans. It exists on paper or in a computer before it exists in the real world. So think about your outline as the same thing. It's a chance for you to see if your closets don't quite line up, if there's a big space that's not being used for some reason, uh, metaphorically speaking, of course. Uh, that's what the outline does, so please give it a shot. If you've never written with an outline before, for essay two, I would suggest that you give it a shot to try um, and, and see if it helps you kind of plan the argument that you're going to make. It also helps you plan, um, as you're thinking about who your audience is, the outline can help you plan what the best tactic to try to convince them of what your main thesis is. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to sort of reflect on the audience and the purpose of the essay, and then you can plot out what the most efficient way to make that argument is going to be and you are doing it without having write a whole thing yet. So plan, then write, and then revise and draft and revise and draft and revise and draft, and then edit and proofread, and then submit, submit. So I hope this has been helpful. If it hasn't, don't tell me because you'll hurt my feelings. Thanks. When I bought the ring light, I didn't realize it had this cell phone attachment permanently mounted in the center of it. So, you know, cool. <laughs>